Good morning, everyone. Scott Galloway with the Texas Water Development Board. I'm an outreach specialist with the board, basically promoting and marketing our financial assistance programs. And uh, happy to be with you this morning to share some updated information on financial assistance. Exciting times at the agency for all our agencies, right? Lots of new programs coming down the pike, potentially lots of new dollars. Uh, and all of the existing programs are extremely busy. Just like everyone, probably we're very busy, short staff, a lot of work, a lot of new work coming down the pike. But as uh, probably most of you know, the, the big topic right now is the potential new one billion dollars that the voters must approve in November for fund financial assistance for the Water Development Board. And so um, I'm sure everyone's seen a lot of headlines and media uh, announcements about the new program. Our official tagline at the Water Development Board, stand by for further notice. Stand by for further notice. I'm not saying anything about the new program because the executive management has not approved our talking points or details other than stand by. We have a news article that was released in our newsletter. It has some generic information and details. If you're not subscribed to our newsletter, I would highly recommend that you do. But the main point is, we will be, we will have a Senate Bill 28 FAQ posted on our website soon. What is soon? They've been saying that since the regular session ended. So soon's coming soon. And, uh, but it's exciting. The way I understand it, the hundred, the $1 billion will go into a new program. The Water Development Board will have uh, a great deal of flexibility how we manage the new funds if it's approved by the voters in November. And basically, it will help make deposits into existing financial assistance programs, such as the State Participation Program, EDAP, uh, Rural Assistance Fund, things like that. If it goes through, we're going to be extremely busy developing policies, procedures, timelines, all of those details. But we've been through this before. Remember, just a few years ago, we did the same thing with the SWIFT program. Uh, legislature approval sent to the voters, voters overwhelmingly approved SWIFT. That was uh, 2015. We were able to make commitments on that those new SWIFT dollars in the late fall of 2016. And I expect that will ha happen again also. Hopefully that timeline will be that quick, but we don't know. Everyone is, uh, is scrambling, putting together their ideas, brainstorming thoughts, ideas, and things like that on how the programs will actually shake out and be available to the local utilities across the state. So again, stand by, sign up for the newsletter. I think someone, if I have the newsletter link on our website, I'll share that with you. Please take a few minutes and uh, take a look at it. If anyone else from the agency has uh, new comments that they would like to share about uh, Senate Bill 28 and the new potential funding, uh, you could please share that. I'd like to learn too. <laughs> The other thing that we have available, though, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about our traditional programs. We've had, you know, a, uh, a norm, enormous demand and great success, primarily with our federal programs, the state revolving funds, but the clean water and the drinking water programs are typically oversubscribed to um, the local utilities, I mean, there's such a huge demand, as you know, for infrastructure funding. So unfortunately, we, we are not able to fund all the projects that come to us through our application process, but we are able to uh, share and fund quite a few projects across the state. 
The base program, I'm going to share that on my screen right now. The base program starting for the new fiscal year. Am I not able to share a screen? It looks like my button's grayed out. Oh, here we go. This is base program draft numbers coming up to the Water Development Board starting September 1. But as everyone knows, draft can be uh, uh, very different from the final version. But these are the state fiscal year for 24. These are the base programs. What do I mean by base programs? These are the, the traditional programs that the agency has had for many years, uh, but going back to the 80s, 1980s, and 1990s. Uh, no significant changes on the base programs. Open solicitation period will begin in December. Final applications due in early March of 2024. And the reason I'm calling this the base programs, these are our traditional programs we've had, because we have two new categories also associated with the SRF programs, and that's funds from the IIJ, the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, primarily lead service line and lead replacement programs, and then the emerging contaminants programs. Both of those two new programs for us, applications uh, were received in the spring. We had a tremendous uh, demand for the funds. We had, uh, I think, 260 plus applications for the lead service line program and uh, a large number of applications for the emerging contaminants also and uh, more than we had funds for we had about 213 million i think for uh, the lead program and about 56 million for the emerging contaminants program and it looks like we have applications in house that that meet those or exceed those numbers Stop sharing a minute. The uh, the new programs, the lead and the emerging contaminants, we will have additional rounds of funding for that probably in the spring again of 2024. Don't know the dollar amounts yet. Everyone's just again busy working on the analysis of what we did receive and the process and procedures for the next round of funding. So again, stay tuned. That's as I keep saying, stay tuned. Everyone's busy developing the steps and the processes, but um, sign up for the newsletter. You'll be the first to know when the newsletter comes out. Do we have any questions specifically on funding? Also have funding that we did receive funding for the flood infrastructure program, the same dollar amount that we requested in our legislation uh, uh, request. We did receive that. So that program looks like it will be uh, continuing on a positive note. Uh, other programs looks like uh, we hope that they'll also be continuing on positive notes too, especially if we receive the 1 billion new funding. Anyone else from the board here have any uh, additional information they want to share about any of our funding programs? We're still doing quite a few workshops. We're working with the Texas World Water Association doing the lead service line inventory replacement workshops. Uh, we're doing financial assistance workshops on online and in person. We have one in LaGrange, Texas next week uh, on Thursday, the 27th, where we're going out and talking to the local communities, trying to let them know about what's available, processes, procedures, and those type of things. So we do those monthly around the state, and we're also starting to do some webinar type uh, promotion of the funding programs too. That's all I have this morning uh, for funding updates. You know, keep an eye out on our website, keep an eye out on the newsletters and uh, more to come. Thanks a lot, appreciate it. Thank you, Scott, appreciate it. All right, next up we have occupational licensing. Teresa, are you on? We'll go ahead and move on then. Uh, next up, we have Office of Compliance and Enforcement. Good morning, James. Thank you. Thank you. I'm obviously not Christian Mills Rock. 
you're looking at the agenda. Um, she had to be out unexpectedly for some family emergencies. So don't have any updates really from OCE that affects this group. We're working on sunset of our uh, legislative implementation like the rest of the agency. Nothing really um, other than what you're going to hear about later on that affects this group. So I'm here if we have any questions for OCE. Andy Gardner. All right. Thank you, Andy. All right, next up we have plan and technical review section in the water supply division and we'll, we will have Eric uh, giving us an update. Uh, my name is Eric Simon, Joel Klump is out today. Uh, uh, we're, we're in a similar position to OCE. We don't have a, a extensive update. It's uh, generally business as usual for us, but I didn't want to talk about uh, one thing in particular. Uh, <clears throat> we've seen a sharp increase in the number of requests to accelerate our review process. Uh, you know, in uh, uh, typically our section has about 400 to 500 uh, projects in review at any given time. We're up over 700 right now. Uh, everybody's busy, so you know that uh, that's that's not a, an excuse. But what that means is when we have uh, that workload in conjunction with the kinds of water shortages that we're seeing now, everybody's hurt for water too. So uh, the uh, over the last five years, we've seen about a five percent uh, per annum increase in requests for emergency authorizations uh, for uh, PWS improvements for uh, uh, accelerated uh, or requests for expedited reviews. Uh, that five percent, five to eight percent per year increase this year, were uh, uh, our increase is about we're looking at about thirty to forty percent. In requests. So there's a limit to what we can do because every request, our, our typical uh, uh, process, we review requests in the order received. It's a simple process. Uh, any request for an expedited review bumps everything else down the list. And there's a, a, a public health uh, uh, sorry, I lost the word I'm looking for. Uh, there are public health impacts to that. So uh, if you are looking for an expedited review of plans and specifications or rule exception, or if you're looking for an emergency authorization of uh, uh, PWS improvements because you're looking at because uh, the PWS may potentially run out of water in very near future, uh, the we have generally two criteria. One uh, is the request is almost a default no unless the PWS is going to run out of water, unless there, there's going to be a uh, major impact of water quality with human health impacts. And then the third one that uh, uh, is not recognized as much is if the PWS is looking at uh, missing a deadline for funding because that also has indirect but still present uh, impact for human health down the road. So uh, I just wanted to make those clear. Uh, if please don't hesitate to reach out if you if you think you're experiencing experiencing an emergency, reach out to OCE, reach out to us because the first thing we're going to do when a PWS comes to PTRS and says, hey, we've got this emergency we need help with. The very first call we make is to reach and say, hey, you know, do you all know anything about this? This isn't a, you know, not in a, you know, not in a negative way. You know, we're not looking to get anybody in trouble. We just want to know, hey, are are you at region aware of this issue? And can you fill us in on it? So for PWSs, you can uh, you can short circuit the process and get faster response if you've already gone to OCE and if OCE is already aware of your situation. Then that helps PTRS. So anyway, that's uh, that's about all we have. Um, the uh, uh, again, I, I emphasize: please don't hesitate to reach out if you you know if you're experiencing health issues, uh, you know potential health issues or funding issues that uh, PWS improvements can fix. Uh, and uh, other than that, if you have any uh, questions for planning technical review, uh, let me know. Thanks. Eric, next up we got Stephen, Drink Water Special Functions. So my name is Stephen Swearinga. I'm the um, section manager for the Drinking Water Special Functions section. Just a couple of things 
One is we still have spaces for uh, virtual attendees at the public drinking water conference. Um, if um, you didn't get signed up to go in person, uh, you can still go virtually. Um, I highly recommend it. We've got lots of good speakers coming um, and lots of uh, opportunities for folks still to, to interact. Um, so the other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit today, and, and Sean is going to drop some links into the chat here um, about boil water notices. So we're in um, hurricane season um, and hopefully nothing comes of that. Um, I don't know what name are we on yet? Nobody knows. OK, so so far so good. Um, <laughs> the ones that we actually remember the names that we got to worry about, right? Um, so I just wanted to go over boil water notice stuff real quick, uh, because when you're in an emergency, um, that's when you're in your, you know, your oh no moment, um, or what am I supposed to do moment? So we have um, a quick guide, a handy dandy quick guide um, that I recommend you all grab. Sean, Sean is going to drop it into. It's already in the chat. Sorry. It's already in the chat. All right. Good job, Sean. Um, so if you guys want to look at that, I'm just going to go over it real quick. So you guys know, you know, you're you're doing a boil water notice in response to an actual known uh, contamination event or um, as a precautionary measure in the event that there there may be some contamination. So um, so low distribution pressure, water outages, um, you know, actual E. coli samples, uh, uh, turbidity levels um, uh, elevated, um, you get Finished water doesn't have adequate disinfectant ritual, all, all of those kinds of circumstances, and I'm sure you guys could probably come up with a few others. Um, and so when you should, you know, issue the boil water notice within 24 hours, you need to let us know uh, within 10 days. Well, need to let you should issue the boil water notice as soon as possible. You need to let us know within 24 hours and you need to provide the documentation to us within 10 days. Um, so one of the links has um, links to well, it has additional links to all the different types of notices, uh, public notice and boil water notices. So uh, we actually provide templates for you to use for doing the notices. Um, so when you're doing uh, community notices, you need to go to um, radio and TV, uh, public, publicized in uh, a local daily newspaper, direct delivery or continuous posting or uh, electronic delivery and uh, or electronic system. That's actually not an or, it's an and. Um, and then for non-community systems, direct delivery uh, or continuous posting uh, and uh, or uh, electronic delivery. Um, so if you're using continuous posting, uh, posting needs to be posted for as long as um, uh, as seven days, for as long as the violation exists or seven days. And then um, the PDF, when you're ready to, to Return, uh, well, I, I'm all compliance guys, so return to compliance are the words that come to mind. But uh, when you're ready to rescind the notice, um, um, you need to do that in the same manner as you've issued the notice. It needs to be done within 24 hours. And you have to have met all the requirements to, to do that. So you have to have distribution pressure that's greater than 20. Uh, distribution system needs to be flushed you have, and have a, a minimum um, uh, disinfectant residual. Um, and uh, PWS is with surface water or groundwater need to have um, uh, uh, NTU below one and uh, PWSs have to meet all the, the requirements for microbial sampling. So you have to do at least one, um, well, really two um, microbial samples um, that are marked special, please mark them special, They're not for compliance, it's for special. Um, and um, those need to be taken from representative locations in your distribution system, um, and you need to have actually received the negative uh, result um, to lift the notice. Then you need to let us know uh, that you're rescinding the notice within 24 hours um, and provide us the documentation within 10 days. So um, again, this quick guide, I mean, I went through that pretty quick, didn't I? Lives up to its name. So um, uh, it's really, it's a handy dandy thing. Um, the the website has uh, more elaborate explanations of all the, the rule requirements, has links to the rules, um, and also has links to um, the, the templates for uh, doing the notice. Are there any questions about that? Yes. 
thinking? Is there specific changes? Or do you have any advice to public water systems in response to HB 3810? I think Michelle is going to cover that. Okay. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Nothing in the chat. All right. Great. I'm still saying it's phone. Thank you all. All right. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Next up, we have drinking water standards section, which is me. Um, so the updates we have are uh, largely going to be covered later in this meeting. So we have some form updates um, coming up for the revised total call form rule, MRF uh, instructions for how to complete that positive reporting for um, total call forms. And then we also have the LCR um, MRF um, that we're going to cover and the WQP water quality parameter monitoring forms um, this afternoon. Uh, there is going to be a portion for some lab stakeholders to provide us feedback on the optimal water quality parameter forms. And in, any other questions? I'll leave the rest of the updates to the forums to Laura, Claire, and uh, Emmett um, to cover here in a bit. Um, also, we're going to be doing some frequently asked questions from Laura as well. Um, and again, just to reiterate, the Public Drinking Water Conference is coming up here pretty soon, August 8th and 9th. Um, there is, um, like Stephen mentioned, um, there is also a lab stakeholder portion for that as well, if you're interested in that. Um, and of course, all that information is going to be made available online as well if you can attend. Uh, on YouTube later at, at a later point. Um, as far as legislative recaps, I'll leave that for Michelle here at the end. Um, and I will leave drinking water standards there for now. Um, going on from there, we have the emergency preparedness and response section, which will also be getting some additional information here in a little bit. But, uh, Rena? Thank everyone. I would like to introduce myself. I am a new section manager for the emergency preparedness and response section. So even though I am new to this section, I'm not new to the agency. I have been working with the agency for 15 years, started with waste permit division as a project manager and uh, work lead. And later I moved to remediation division and work as a team lead there for five years. Prior to that, I work in the private environmental company, which was based in New York City, I have a master's degree in environmental science. And I'm here and glad to be a part of this big family. And now I would like to give you a few updates and uh, of a section starting with the emergency preparedness plans. So we received uh, almost 4,000 emergency preparedness plans, and we are currently reviewing them. And I would like to say thank you for those who submitted those plans and for those who work with our reviewers closely when you have questions or recommendations from our reviewers. So the review time depends on a few factors. So the first factor is the number of reviewers, which is limited. The next factor is the review process. So we are trying to make this process more efficient. And the review time also depends on conversation between us and you, how quickly we can get response from you how quickly you can address our, um, our questions. So please review your, we do send information to you via email. So please review emails and communicate with us. If you need more time, let us know. We are here and we are open to, we are ready to work with you, but um, let's communicate on that. And also please ensure that we do have correct information, correct contact information. So uh, if you haven't submitted a plan and received a notice of violation or notice of enforcement and need, um, need help with this plan, need help to be in compliance, 
please reach out to our section so we can help you directly or through the financial managerial and technical assistance program and i will discuss this program today later i'll give you more details about this program so please help us to help you to have an approved eb um, drought i would like to touch on drought a little bit because we are in the middle of the hottest season of the year uh, being prepared, it means uh, minimizing damages and losses and to ensure uh, the non-interruption water service. So we need to be prepared for emergency situations. It's not, like we are, okay. it's not like we are waiting for them, no, but we Nobody. should be well aware of the situations. Um, there is an online form for public water systems, which needs to be used to submit the current Sorry. status of the Sorry. water use restrictions. So yes, please use this form and let us know what kind of restriction, water use restriction, your system currently is, um, uh, you are currently implementing. So we use this information to create a list of the systems and this list is provided on the TCU website. So you can see who reported what. And currently we have there um, seven uh, water system which have less than 180 days of water. So yes, just uh, be prepared and talk to your, go through, uh, check your EPB plan just to ensure that you know your steps, what needs to be done in case of that. But that's it. Do you have any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, next up, we have the quality assurance update. Um, Jessica Hoke is our QA manager. She is out of the office, but did provide some notes. Um, like I said earlier, there is an upcoming lab stakeholder meeting, uh, the second day of the public drinking water conference. Um, if you would like to attend that meeting, you can email pwsqa at tcq.texas.gov. Um, and additionally, that meeting um, link, if you're attending virtually, will be sent out the first week of August. After that, um, we are in the process of doing updates to our quality assurance project plan for addendas two, three, and four for the revised total call form and the lead and copper rule programs. Um, so those are in the process of coming out. Uh, we expect those to be published sometime between November and December of 2023. Um, there is also an ongoing update for addenda one for the chemical samples uh, collection where we have the contractors go out and collect you. Uh, we're working to update that across the board. Um, that's considered a substantial change, um, but largely it will be um, pulling out specific references to documents that are not included in that document, and then putting them all and compiling them into Addenda 1. Um, so that'll be uh, a longer term update, but again, two, three, and four for our TCR, LCR, and WQPs, November, December. Um, and of course, if you have any questions on that, um, please let us know, but also the lab stakeholder meeting will be a good opportunity for, for any other questions as well, and to get an idea of what some of the other labs and stakeholders are, are feeling about those. All right. So that takes us um, to the end of our introductions and, and program updates. Um, so we're a little bit ahead of schedule, surprisingly. Um, so do we want to take a quick break? Yeah. OK, quick break. We're going to pick back up here at 10 a.m. So we're, we're still on track. And uh, again, we're going to circle back uh, with emergency preparedness and response section. We're going to talk about um, FMT assistance and uh, Hurricane preparedness. So uh, thank you all. Appreciate your patience as we got started. And uh, again, we'll we'll circle back here at uh, 10 a.m. Thank you. All right, everyone. Uh, it's 10 o'clock. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. I think we fixed all the audio issues. Yeah.
<laughs> All right, everyone, thank you. We're going to be talking about financial managerium, the technical assistance program. And yeah. Thank you. Again. So when people ask me, what is your main role at TCQ? I always have the uh, one answer to help people to understand rules and regulations, to help people to be in compliance with rules and regulations. And if there are options to help them to select the option which is suitable for them. And we always need to take into consideration money and time we spend on those options and also what kind of goal we go to achieve under certain options. So today I would like to discuss what kind of help do we offer um, to you? So what is available here? Um, Okay, this is uh, the program name is Financial Managerian and um, probably go to uh, Financial Managerial and Technical Assistant Program. And through this program, we offer free financial managerial and technical assistance to you all. So if you feel that your system has operational problem, so that's the good program to use. Through this program, we can uh, assist you on a variety of different pro problems, and also we can help you uh, to check what exactly your system needs and how exactly we can help your system. So currently we have contact with Texas Water, Water Association. So what exactly do we offer? We do offer on-site assistance, one-on-one -on -one support on a variety of um, topics for public water drinking systems and also wastewater uh, systems. So under the lead and copper rule revision and public system must to submit a service line inventory form to us by October 16, 2024. So if you need help with this form or you need training on LCRR requirements, please let us know and we can help you with that. Uh, also, we can help you to consider if consolidation with neighboring system um, can help you to solve problems. If we determine that consolidation is possible, we will work with Public Utility Commission to help you to go through the process. We also develop a lot of technical training and technical guidance. And through our Texas optimization program, we developed um, a few trainings, which we called directed assistant models. Uh, here's a link on the slide, so you can go and check those models. There's 12 models. And again, you can read them or you can call us and request this assistance. So we can provide on-site training, uh, instructor-led training for you. This is a list of tasks which are covered by this program. And uh, this is not the full list, it's just a few tasks which are covered. Yes, yeah, just keep in mind that there are different categories and um, check those categories and determine if we can help you uh, with problems which you have. And also I would like to mention that through this program, you cannot address, this program can help you not only to address the current issues, but also can help you to prevent future issues. If you feel that something doesn't look right, you might have a problem in the future. Also, please talk to us and check if we can help you. This is the list of the most popular FMT tasks. <laughs> Excuse me. The first one, yes, uh, emergency uh, preparedness plan. 
we have a lot of systems with uh, this plan. And again, if you still, um, if you haven't submitted the plan or you feel that uh, your plan um, should be modified, please let us know and we can work with you. One of the popular tasks is also uh, exceedances of maximum contaminant levels. So if your chemicals are above the MCL and you don't know how to reduce those concentrations, please work with us and we'll help you on this task. Uh, water loss and conservation, there's few tasks under that category. Um, you can see that drought contingency plan. So, um, Again, if you don't have one or you feel that one which you have doesn't suit you well and it needs to be modified, work with us. Leaking detection is also uh, such a popular task. And like recently we received a few weeks ago, we received an email from a small public water system which has a major water loss and they were not able to find this leak in the system and they were not able to find a company who could help them uh, to find this, uh, to fix this problem. So they sent an email to us, and now we're working with them to fix this problem. Uh, so we're going to have a booth at Public Drinking Water Conference. So please come and talk to us. Um, if you're not sure how exactly we can help and uh, if those issues which you have can be addressed through this program, please talk to us. We will be glad to meet you there and um, help you with all your questions. And also we organize uh, a lot of free um, lab service line inventory workshops. Some of them are scheduled in July and in August, and those are free workshops. Here's a link to, uh, you can register um, through this link, which is located on the slide. Uh, so yes, please plan to attend if you need help with this um, inventory form. If you're not able to attend those workshops, but still want to learn um, about um, line in, in inventory uh, information, want to get more information. So you can, there's a, um, one workshop was recorded, May 24th workshop was recorded and is available on our YouTube channel. Uh, there's a TCQ YouTube news channel and again, here's a link so you can just watch this workshop. Uh, I would like to share a few numbers uh, uh, from this program. So the total number of systems that were offered FMT assistance is 636. Total number of systems that received FMT assistance is 509. So like not all systems decided to take this help from us, but uh, still we held, we were able to help 509 systems. And when we check the total number of completed assignments, so this number is a little bit higher, 762. That's because of some of the systems submitted a few requests and we were able to help them. So how to submit a request? The good news is that you don't need to go through this long and convoluted form. Um, the, the process is so easy and I love it. You just need to send us an email and tell us your name, provide some contact information and provide information about your public order system, just the name and ID number, and briefly discuss what kind of help you need. So it could be as help developing an emergency preparedness plan. That's it. So we do have internal forms and we will fill out those forms. Um, so you don't need to uh, uh, you don't need to fill out any forms for us. It's just a quick email. And I really like the way um, this information uh, should be submitted to us. Uh, so again, here's uh, information about uh, our program. So email, phone number and link. And what I 
would like you to remember from ab about this program that the program is free. Um, we can provide your on site assistance. Uh, through this program, you can address not only current issues, but also prevent the future issues. There's no limitations. You can submit as many requests as you need. And um, the way to submit this information, it's so easy and I love it. Just send us a quick email. It will take you a few minutes um, to, um, to send this email to us. And we will be glad to help you and we'll be glad to work with you. So again, uh, our main role here is to help you to be in compliance. Okay, any questions? Now, Christina. Thank you. Great. Next up, we are talking about hurricane preparedness, and I will pull up the slide. All right, and we have Christina Hunt uh, giving this presentation. And uh, good morning, everyone. Like Jane said, my name is Christina DuPont. I work for the Texas Optimization Program under ARENA here at TCEQ. Um, and I've been asked to talk a little bit about preparing for hurricane season. I like to preface this with saying, if you are one of the water systems on the coastal third of the state, this applies to you. If you are not, the concepts and recommendations in this presentation still apply to you for emergency situations. Um, it is not unlikely that you will experience some kind of severe storm at some point. And a lot of these concepts um, and, and recommendations be something that will be very useful to any system that's going um, through some kind of weather emergency. So to start off, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration every year releases their prediction for the coming hurricane season. And as you all know, we are currently in that. And in about 13 days or so, we're going to step into um, the peak or the height of that season in August through October. This year, up to now, Stephen so asked, I believe that there's only been one named storm. Um, and there's only about, I'm sorry? Dom. Okay. More than one, dang it. <laughs> um, so, but they are predicted to only have about one to four uh, serious hurricanes this year, hopefully on the lower end. Um, and there's about 70% chance that it's a normal to uh, below normal year. So fingers crossed for that percentage. There's only a 30% chance of it being a higher than normal year. So hopefully El Nino kind of keeps those hurricanes at bay for us. All right, so there's about five categories of preparation that we have come up with. Um, identifying key personnel is going to be the first one. I know you all know that a water system cannot operate no matter how hard we try to come up with autonomous water systems. You need personnel. So identifying essential personnel is going to be key. And then doing administrative preparation and physical preparation are going to be the next two categories. And then, of course, going through recovery and repair preparation. And then the last, but definitely not least, is going to be communicating with state and emergency agencies. So identifying key personnel. You'll need to um, adjust work schedules so that at least one person is available during any kind of extreme um, weather event. And be sure to go ahead and stock food and water and essentials for them if they are required to stay at the plant for their safety. Um, they also want to require that they pack a go bag or a jump bag so that at the drop of the hat, they are able to move from wherever they are uh, to your facilities on site. And then something that systems don't think about is potentially offering alternate forms of transportation. If their primary transportation is somehow um, debilitated, I guess, you'd want another way for them to either get to your facilities or get out of your facilities. And then train all staff to at least 
uh, perform the bare minimum startup and shutdown tasks for your facilities in case they are the only one available. Um, I know I've heard stories about operators that get stranded at the plant when they were not trained to be there and they are the only ones available on site for a few days. So everyone should know at least those uh, startup and shutdown procedures. And then establishing an emergency uh, base or somewhere where people can come together during that emergency situation. Um, so identify that and stock that with all the essentials, first aid, food, and water. And establishing lines of communication for emergency agencies such as police and fire is going to be essential. Um, and then potentially creating a plan with them to check on any personnel that may be at the plant. Um, for their safety, of course. So we talked about emergency preparedness plans and everyone should be at least familiar. So review those, make sure they're up to date. Um, if you need to update the contact information for any of those emergency agencies, please do so. Um, if you not have not created an emergency preparedness plan, it's a great time to do that. So go ahead and get that updated. Identify contacts um, that may be able to provide you emergency water in case you do have a water outage. Uh, TDAM, the Texas Department of Emergency Management, is a great resource for that. Um, I know in the past, HEB has also collaborated with a lot of water systems to get them pallets of water um, during outages, or even another public water system that is nearby. Um, you'll find through this entire presentation, a lot of what I talk about is going to be communication. So opening those pathways of communication to essential personnel, um, emergency agencies, and also your neighboring public water systems is going to be key. And then contact your laboratories and make sure that they um, have a method for you to deliver samples to them. If they expect to be impacted by the uh, storm event, go ahead and reach out to a secondary agency. You're going to want to get your samples submitted um, and analyzed as soon as possible after the, the event is over. So having that already set up is also going to be very important. And then work with them to resupply any sampling um, containers or reagents that you might need to collect those samples before submission. All right, more on administrative preparedness. Contact your local media. So Stephen said that there is a new boil water notice guide out. Go ahead and create those boil water notices preemptively so you don't have to do it while you're doing 100 other things. Um, also have an emergency disinfection guidance for your customers. If there's low pressure or an outage and they somehow have to disinfect water um, from their tap, make sure that they know how to do that by creating that uh, guidance. And also potentially a shelter in place if that is needed. Create it before you ever need it so that you can you have it on hand and make sure that um, the media centers have that as well so that they can send it out to your customers as soon as possible. Another thing is download historical data off of your computers. It still is your responsibility to maintain that historical information. So even if your computers crash from electrical surges or get flooded, you are still responsible for maintaining that data. So go ahead and have a backup source of data, whether that's USB, external hard drive, something like that. And then re review your distribution maps and make sure that they have valves on them and make sure that your uh, personnel have copies of those. A lot of the times situations um, in distribution can be resolved by closing or opening valves and a lot of systems don't actually know where those are. So make sure that your maps are updated um, with those valve locations. All right, so move, moving on to physical preparedness, um, make sure that your all access roads are, are clean and refreshed so that you don't have to worry about accessing your facilities during a storm. Make sure all your pumps, motors, and spare parts are available in case that you need them. Check fuel, oil, and lubrication in generators and vehicles and, and refill those if needed. And then move any of those equipments out of flood areas. I know how many times systems uh, overlook that and they lose all of that equipment during flooding events. 
And this kind of goes out speaking board up windows, um, have sandbags ready, isolate any pipes that may be crossing open waterways in case of those become damaged. Um, that valve map will come in really handy during that situation. And then move any documents to a secure location so that they're not damaged by rain or flooding. And again, have ample bacteriological sampling equipment. You will need those when you collect your samples for lab submission. And for those systems that do have a SCADA or a um, supervisory control and data acquisition system, run diagnostics, make sure that those are operating. Um, but if you don't have a SCADA system, no need to worry about that. Just make sure that your controls are operational. You'll need to uh, determine if your pump stations are in flood prone areas. And if they are, go ahead and shut them off and disconnect the electricity. You don't want personnel going out there checking on them during storms to be electrocuted. Um, label any plant piping and chemicals. Occasionally, we'll have personnel being shared between water systems. And if a shared personnel or shared member of another water system is not familiar with your system, they're going to have no idea what's treated water, what's wastewater, what chemicals are where. So having all of that labeled for them is going to make that process uh, a lot easier. If you have tanks, make sure to fill them to capacity so that at least your customers have some water, especially if they're elevated storage tanks, you may be able to get away with providing pressure that way. Um, if you have tanks that are empty, and you don't want them floating off, it might be a good idea to fill them with water and, and weigh those down as well. And then again, a, a electrical, go ahead and, and disconnect the electricity to any evacuated buildings. All right, so now let's move on to the recovery and repair um, after any kind of emergency event. So I recommend if you have not already become a member of TexWarn, that's the Texas Water and Wastewater um, Partnership. That's a statewide kind of mutual aid program that will provide you if they can any um, personnel, equipment that you might not already have on site. Um, if you choose not to become a TexWarn partner, you may just want to communicate with nearby water systems for any equipment that they may have that they can provide you uh, after an emergency event. Go ahead and identify any cleanup crews that you might need. Um, in the past winter storm had a lot of downed trees and limbs, so cleanup crews for stuff like that, wind damage. Um, and then establish communication with your power supplies. I know that this is a portion of the emergency preparedness plan that says you should be in contact with your electrical provider. So go ahead and reestablish that communication if you have not already to make sure that they are aware of your electrical status or what you will need following an emergency event. And then of course, again, with a mutual aid program, borrow or lease any uh, heavy equipment that you might need to make repairs. So something systems may not think about is they're like, oh, I have enough chemicals to supply me during regular circumstances. But a lot of the time after storms, you may need more disinfectant, more chlorine than you normally need, or additional coagulant to, to capture all of the, that high turbid water coming in after flooding events. Make sure you have extra chemicals. Um, so contact your chemical vendors and make sure they're aware of your needs. And then, of course, check any intakes or pumps or uh, wells that may have become damaged or, or full of debris. Make sure those are cleared before you turn them back on. All right. And last but not least, this is kind of the biggest communication portion. Communicate with the state agencies, us, your regional offices. Um, let them know where your command post is so that they know who to contact or where to go to if they need to get a hold of you and there's no way to do so using phone or internet. Um, you may also want to provide your regional office, if you have not already, a copy of your emergency preparedness plan so that they are aware that one, you have one, and two, that some of the options that you're going to use so that they know that, that you're on top of it and they don't have to reach out to you after. And then here in Austin, we highly recommend that you contact our chemical sampling team um, for any impacts that may have resulted from that event. If they are not, if the chemical sampling team is not able to access sampling points, let them know so that they can then let um, our contract know to not even go out to that for danger or whatever. So you can send that email to pwschem at tceq.texas.gov. 
And then the same goes for any surface water treatment plants. Um, any impacts to your surface water monitoring compliance, whether you were not able to access a facility for samples, it's going to impact your SW more data. Let them know so that they're aware and can make a note. Um, and you can do so by emailing swtr at tceq.texas.gov. Or if you'd rather just call the main line here in Austin, that phone number is here as well. And you can um, ask for any one of these teams or divisions that you need to talk to. All right, and then um, I'm gonna put a plug in for TOP since I am a member of the Texas Optimization Program. If you need any kind of assistance with treatment or chemical dosing, disinfection, if you have capacity issue questions, like really technical questions, um, TOP is a great resource. We do also, like FMT does a lot of onsite training. TOP also does a lot of onsite training, um, usually for more technical topics. So if you would like to contact us about uh, getting one of those or have questions after an emergency event, you can always email top at texas or tcq.texas.gov and we will be able to get back to you with a response or set up a training opportunity. All right, and that kind of concludes my preparation for hurricane season slash emergency weather event. Um, does anybody have any questions? No questions. In, in the chat, just uh, Christina is a rock star and great job. Well, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, thanks, y'all. All right, thanks, Christina. Thank All right, so following the agenda, that leads us right into another break. I know we just had one. Um, yeah, great. If you want, otherwise, I think I'm going to take a little break. I'm good. Okay, well, we're we're good here to to keep going forward with our um, our agenda. So I will get the monitoring form updates here situated, and uh, we will keep moving forward. Thanks, everyone. All right, I'm in. I'll take it Thank you so much, James. Hey, y'all, I'm Emmett. I'm with the RTCR team. I'm just going to go over a few of the updates that we've made to our microbial reporting form. All right, so what is different? Uh, as you can see, it's uh, it looks pretty similar to the old one. We've just made a few tweaks, uh, basically to make it more user-friendly and hopefully prevent some of the common errors that we find on this form. Uh, I'm gonna go over exactly what those changes are, just so that everyone knows exactly what to look out for. Uh, so we have made the MRF now able to be filled out digitally. Uh, took us a while to, to get it fully accessible, uh, but now the form is fully functional. Uh, you can now fill out every field digitally. Uh, you can also still obviously fill it out by hand, print out in that uh, method as well. So you just have the option now to do it either way. Uh, the chain of custody section has moved on the form. Uh, it's now going to be at the bottom. The boxes are a bit bigger now, so hopefully people with longer names aren't having to squeeze their names in the box, get a little more room. Uh, and yeah, the chain of custody section is all now uh, consolidated to one point at the bottom. Uh, we are moving to military time only on this form. Uh, this is to prevent having to circle the tiny AM or PM. We're just doing military time. So just keep that in mind moving forward when you're filling out this new MRF form. Uh, we are now also doing separate boxes for free or total chlorine residuals. Again, we had the issue coming up of circling the tiny F or the tiny T. Uh, so hopefully this, you know, gets rid of that issue. Now you're just going to write your residual in the respective box. Uh, the instructions for completing the MRF have also changed slightly. Uh, we have consolidated the public water system instructions with the lab instructions. So you'll find those all on one document now instead of two separate documents, as you can see here, separated by color. So um, 
PWS systems will continue to use the MRF as issued by their laboratory. The labs are going to have six months to uh, conform to the new changes on the MRF. Uh, so continue to use the MRFs provided by your laboratory. Uh, the new form is going to be available on the PWSSP webpage. I believe Claire is going to drop us a link in the chat. So if you do want to review the new form there, please feel free to go over those new changes. But again, you'll be using the MRFs as issued by your labs, and they'll have some time to conform to these new changes. So it's not going to be something instant, but you will begin to see these things uh, update over the next few months here. And if you have any questions on any of this, please feel free to email me. Uh, does anyone have any questions in the room? Absolutely. So one question was asking for, you know, if it's allowable to use digital signatures. Um, I believe. I feel like this is a Jessica question. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I would say that this is, if you are a person who is planning to fill out the form digitally, that you should work with our uh, compliance or our quality assurance officer, yeah. Jessica, um, to, to make sure that that uh, suits our needs. Yes, yes. Oh, the next question, did that say email? Is that necessary? Was there a spot for email? Mm, I don't think that there's okay. a required there's email, but you can put an email. Uh, you know, it does tend, I can say uh, from our end of the uh, compliance spectrum, we do use those emails quite a bit. It comes in handy when a positive sample does come through. We can provide you all of the guidance to for resampling. So it's not a required field, but it is very helpful to include an email on there. And then Joni asked, um, what do you do with monochloramine system residuals? That's still going to be on. So I don't, can you go back to that, that section? So the, the residuals, the way that they were recorded on there before was that you wrote the, the residual reading and then you would circle either total, uh, the T, or free for the F. And so there was... Um, Lots of issues where the free or total was not circled whenever we would receive the form. And then we were constantly having to reach out to systems to get that information from water systems. So this um, requires you to put the residual reading for either free or total monochloramine reading. Uh, oh, wait, monochloramine. Yeah, I don't, yeah. monochloramine is. I'm sorry. Yes, that's what they mean, though, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, they would either record the free or the total, this question's asking monochloramine, in that box instead of circling free or total. Uh, hope that helps. Any other questions? No other questions on why. Oh wait, oh, so you don't want ammonia and mono? We do not want, no, ammonia and mono. Not for our purposes, yeah. at least. Yeah. Yeah. If you're recording that for your system, you would be recording it on, um, you know, internal documents or um, you know, wherever you keep NAP information, uh, recording it there. But it doesn't need to be reported for microbial reporting. Is that Joni asked you? Yes. Joni, just so you know, the, the requirement under the revised total coal form rule and under our two, 209, uh, 290 109, which is the, the chlorine residual side of things. Um, require that a chlorine residual will be taken at each uh, back to sampling site at the same time. So this is meeting that requirement. The chloramine effectiveness requirement is separate um, and is for process control purposes, not for compliance purposes. So it's not caught here. And then one more question. Um, if the sampler email is not required, what is required? Is the phone required? So I believe that we're, we have the required fields in the instructions. Um, and again, this will be on the PWSSP webpage. And this has, uh, I believe that these are the required fields. Um, I guess I would follow up that to say that um, you need to have a phone number or an email, one or the other, on this form so that you can be contacted in case the samples are positive. Um, so we will be re we reach out to systems whenever we receive positive results uh, from the laboratory. So if we don't have your contact information, what we're gonna do at that point is we're gonna go on to Drinking Water Watch 
and we're going to call everybody on that list until we get somebody. So um, if you're a sampler and you want to fulfill the repeat requirements to be in compliance with the rule, I would suggest either putting an email address or a phone number down on there. And then Raya kindly put the instruction page, the link to your RTCR webpage in the chat. Thank you, Raya. If you'll have additional questions, you can always reach out to us um, and we can you know, uh, help you with any questions. Um, I guess one thing to make sure, and I think Emmett, you said it, but um, if you are, um, do, you know, please do not as a water system, take these documents off of our website and start using them. You need to get them from your laboratory that you use. Um, you know, they're on here for resources, but they're primarily, um, you know, on there for the laboratory to give to you whenever it's time for you to take samples. And they will work on the um, implementation of these records uh, or the MRF um, to be in compliance. So, so is, is this form actually being used in the field by the sampler or the digital aspect of this? Or is it still a paper form and then the lab is submitting? So we're seeing more samplers doing digital entry in the field. Like they'll have an iPad where they can mark it. Uh, it is important that all of this is marked in the field. So if you are doing digital entry, it should be at the time of sample collection that you're recording the information. Uh, but you just have the option to do that. We kind of had an eye towards the future on that. We're not expecting a ton of people to use that right away. Uh, you definitely still have the option to do both, but this can be it can be. Yes, yes. Exactly. Okay. So one thing I would say is make sure that you speak to your laboratory. Some of them might only want you to do it on their form if it's a triplicate or something like that, but then it can't be done. You're sending them just an electronic file. So coordinate with your laboratory. Yes. We've provided the option. Great question. All right. Uh, next step. Uh, Laura? Yeah. Yeah. So the next step is to share um, some updates to both the um, LCR monitoring form and the WQP monitoring form. And um, from the lead and copper monitoring team, Michelle Ross is going to share those updates. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me and see the screen, the presentation? Yeah, we can hear you, Michelle. OK, great. Um, so we are going to walk through two different forms here, the lead and copper monitoring form and the water quality parameter monitoring form. Um, so the first one is the lead and copper form. We've made a couple changes here. Uh, the first and probably most apparent to frequent users of this form are the form colors and uh, the digital entry. Um, we're also going to be talking about the removal of the sample type checkboxes and then some expanded instructions. Um, also, the public water system representative sign off has moved to the bottom of the form. And then the mention of the one liter fill line has been removed as well for clarity. And the lab comments have also moved to the bottom of the form. So this is what those changes look like. Um, you know, when we were making these revisions, we were thinking critically about what fields people struggle the most with, what causes the most confusion on the form. And then we also wanted to have the goal of making the forms consistent. We've realized in the past that the lead and copper form and the water quality parameter form did have some differences that might have caused frustration or confusion for people who are monitoring for both. Um, so we've made changes to remedy that. So this is how that form currently looks. So digital entry um, is a new feature that we have added. This is for the um, text entry as well as the check boxes that are on the form. We also have some adjusted field title instructions here for more clarity, um, specifically with the facility ID and sample point ID notation. We've just kind of made minor adjustments here to make it even more clear exactly what needs to be entered for each type of sample. So the public water system representative signature has moved, um, so it'll be on the bottom and it matches the WQP form now. 
And then we realized that some of the one liter fill line language was confusing because not all laboratories have that line. The one liter volume is required, um, but we noticed that with the line being mentioned on the form, uh, people just you know wanted to confirm when their bottle did not have the line. So we've adjusted the language here. And then we've also moved the lab comments as well. So for the WQP form, we've also changed those colors to you know, show the difference between what a lab needs to fill out versus what the system needs to fill out. We also have that digital entry capability and we've removed some treatment fields because they're not really relevant to the samples um, for compliance purposes. We've also removed the sample type checkboxes and we've expanded the instructions for the field headings for clarity here as well. And then we've added a couple rows for the sample collector to accommodate all different types of sample collection, whether it's you as the system taking the samples, whether you have a third party contractor or whether the laboratory is helping you collect those samples. And we've also added um, the checkbox capability for the analytes for all the WQP samples. So here are those changes for the WQP form. Um, We've, we've definitely made an effort for them to match so that you don't feel thrown if you're switching or taking both types of samples. We have that digital capability here for the, the data entry. This includes the checkboxes as well as the, the, the text fields. And then we've, uh, we've just noted here that it's now just a checkbox for if you're using an inhibitor, you don't need to include specific dose dosage rates or anything like that. Here are those adjusted field instructions, just for clarity. And then we have the sample collector fields here. I realize it's a little bit small, but we now have the sample collector name and organization. This can be very helpful if you have a third party contractor and they, you know, they have their own company so they can fully fill out their name and their organization here. We have the sample collector checkbox. So whether it's the public water system, the laboratory or a third party, they're going to check whichever box applies to them. And then the lab ID field has been adjusted here so that they can put the number from their lab approval form, which is form 10450. And then for the analyte checkboxes here, um, for those who monitor WQPs regularly, you'll know that all the analytes here are required except for at the end here with the asterisk is ortho and silica. These are conditionally required. If you're using them for corrosion control, then you need to test for them. If you're not, then they are not required. So oftentimes we have laboratories, um, we like to call it pass through. Some, la uh, some laboratories will analyze a portion and then pass on the sample to a secondary laboratory and they will do the rest of the analysis. Um, with the previous version of the form, all of these were automatically checked. And so for record keeping, uh, we believe that this will help labs have a, a more firm record of which analysis they were actually performing in their laboratory. So for implementation, systems and labs will have the six months, excuse me, from publication date to switch to the updated forms. And then um, unlike RTCR, our forms will be available on the lead and copper page. Um, we encourage systems to download those forms, especially page two with the instructions. And we will be providing the updated forms to the laboratory community once they are available. Um, any modifications to forms must be approved prior prior to use by TCQ, if that is something that you have done in the past. And then if you are using additional chain of custody forms that your laboratory provides you, um, those also need to be included in the analytical reports um, along with the TCEQ forms when, when they report your results to us. And that is all I have today. Are there any questions? No questions in the chat, but any questions in the room? No, looks like no questions in the room either. Thanks, Michelle. Sure thing. All right. Um, go right into it. Sure. Okay. 
Uh, next up, we got Laura um, talking about LCRR resources and frequently asked questions. Can you pull up the LCRR web page? Before I get into the new frequently asked questions, um, just wanted to show some other updates. So Claire Carlton, who's running the uh, lead testing in schools and child care program, has some updates that she wanted to touch on before I jump into all my stuff. So take it away, Claire. Okay, um, I just wanted to cover an update that we made to um, the lead and copper webpage for the schools portion. Um, I think it's at the very bottom. So underneath the school school um, and child care program section, we added um, a document that is here to help water systems create um, their list of schools and child cares. So if you click on this, it will open a um, PDF document. Um, this is just a resource that we put together uh, that shows a few different uh, websites that can be used to create um, that list of school and child cares. So um, there's links on here to the different websites and then some short instructions on how to use those websites. Um, and then we will continue if we find more resources. I know sometimes I've received correspondence from people asking, you know, can we use this resource or this resource? Um, if you find other resources, you're free to share them with us, um, but we will continue to update this if we find additional resources that we think um, would be helpful to you all. And then there's also a template page at the bottom. Uh, there's some definitions and uh, suggested information to keep in there. Um, our contact information is on here, so you can reach out to us if you have any questions. And then there's a template page down here. Um, this is fillable. You don't have to. Um, if you want to record different information for your to create your list, you can do that. This is just some helpful information, um, you know, to, to include in there. But if you want to put more, that's great too. So um, a resource for you guys. And then, like I said, we will continue um, to update this if we have more information. All right. Um, so if you're uh, if you haven't checked out our LCRR web page in a while, um, one of the features of the web page is that we have a frequently asked questions section. Um, we also have oh, right above this frequently asked questions section is a link to the EPA LCRR web page. And I just wanted to highlight the EPA page just for a second because uh, late June, EPA came out with two additional guidance documents for systems. One is for, uh, I think they call it the small entity, it's the small systems and NTNC guidance, uh, developing and maintaining a service line inventory for small entity compliance guide. There's also an eight page uh, fact sheet for developing and maintaining a service line inventory. Um, I personally really like the fact sheet. It's only eight pages. I know some of the feedback we've gotten when EPA has come out with other guidance documents is, oh my gosh, they're so long. How am I, I don't wanna read this thing. It's over a hundred pages. Even um, I think the small, the small system guidance is at least 50 pages. So folks were asking, you know, where is a condensed version of that? So that fact sheet, only eight pages. There's lots of beautiful pictures that EPA has put together. Um, so that's a nice resource that is now available. So you can use the EPA link from our LCRR page to take you there uh, and check out those new guidances. But if we scroll down to our FAQ section, we've made some updates. Scroll down. So some of them we've kept um, some of the previous questions that we've gotten, and we've just added on some of the new questions. Starting down here. And I wanted to go through some of these questions because some of this is um, 
what I feel is a bit of misinformation that we found floating around. So, for example, the first question here is um, that my understanding is that any service line of unknown material, i.e. a lead status unknown service line, um, that are those are considered lead under the LCRR. Is that correct? And that's no, not correct. Unknown service lines should not be reported as lead. Um, unknown or the service line, the lead status unknown classification is its own category under LCRR. So if you have a service line that is unknown, you're not reporting that as lead in the service line inventory. You can report that as lead status unknown. Um, so it is true that reporting lead status unknown does come with some additional steps. There's some public notice required uh, with that, but it's its own category. So, um, you know, the public notice is just required because when you don't know what the service, the material of your service line is, you can't guarantee to your customers that it's non lead. So that's why that's there. But just know that, yeah. Unknown is not the same thing as reporting, but. Um, the next question, a utility has galvanized service line material on the customer side, but unknown or not proven to be lead, not non-lead yet on the utility side. Is this a tier three or a tier five site? So using uh, it's table one, which is the classification of entire service line when ownership is split table. That's within the classifying SLs worksheet in our inventory template form. Um, this scenario that's described would be considered a galvanized requiring replacement service line and is therefore considered a tier three site. The only galvanized requiring replacement sites that are not tier three are those um, from a non-single family residence. But our form 20943 uh, includes formulas that automatically calculate the tiering for you. So as long as all the pertinent information is filled out within that form, you will automatically be calculated your new tiering site. So you don't necessarily have to think through these scenarios yourself. They'll be generated for you automatically. Uh, let's scroll down a little bit. Uh, I don't have service lines, therefore I don't need to do a service line inventory, right? False. All community and non-transient, non-community water systems must submit a service line inventory to the TCQ by October 16th of 2024, even if the only thing that you're reporting is that all of your service lines are non-lead. So I think there were some... Um, some language maybe even within the LCRR itself referring to a lead service line inventory that may have made people believe that I only need to do this if I have lead service lines. And that's that's a little bit misleading. So everyone needs to conduct a inventory of all of their service lines. OK, um, can systems use interviews with senior staff as a form of record? Yes, they can. So documented interviews and affidavits from senior personnel or folks with historic knowledge of the water system um, can be an example of what would be considered other records uh, within the required records uh, to be reviewed under the LCRR. So you can absolutely use interviews with senior staff or anyone with historic knowledge of the water system. Is it true that water systems must excavate service lines to determine if they are lead? No, and in fact, we would prefer folks to come at this with an approach of least invasive to most invasive. So the least invasive you can do, the better, starting with that record review, that's required. So if you can conduct the inventory solely on the record review, that is preferred and that is what's required. But per EPA guidance, this is specifically section 6.1.2, uh, 
remember that no matter the approach, systems must review all historical records listed under the LCRR. And then this information is further outlined in chapter four. It says after required record review and visual inspections with scratch and magnet tests or excavations are acceptable field investigation techniques according to the EPA guidance. And you can also look at chapter five of the guidance, um, specifically sections 5.1 and 5.3. But we also recommend that each public water system document their process and their procedures for any kind of service line inspections in a uh, standard operating procedure. We have a template that water systems can use if they'd like um, to document their process that they choose to do those visual inspections by. Uh, oh, does the inventory need to include irrigation and fire line types? So this is a great question um, with maybe a little bit of a, a confusing answer, but so the EPA's guidance, the guidance for developing and maintaining a service line inventory, it emphasizes that a service line is defined as the pipe connecting the water main to the building inlet. So therefore, any line that goes from a water main to a building should be included in your inventory. But then section 2.2.1 notes that if the service line could be repurposed in the future for potable or non-emergency use, then it should also be included in your inventory. So some folks, especially our NTNC systems, have been asking about um, you know, lines that don't necessarily go to a building and maybe they're currently not being used for potable use. But according to EPA's guidance, if you think that that line could in the future be repurposed for potable use, you should go ahead and include it in your inventory. So I think if in doubt, go ahead and include it. Um, but if you have lines, agricultural lines or something you think will never be used, then that's that's up to the system to make that call. But that's that's going off of EPA's guidance. OK, this was a fun one. Uh, utility A reads the meters and bills for utility B's customers. However, the service lines are maintained by utility B. So which of the two utilities is responsible for inventorying the service lines? And the answer to that is the service line connections are designated to a single public water system. So whichever public water system ID the connections belong to is who should be inventorying those service lines. When filling out TCEQ's inventory form 20943, if a water system has a postal address for the service line, then do they also need to fill out column G, which is other location identifier, and columns H and I, which is the GPS coordinates? So the LCRR requires a location identifier for each service line. Um, and based on feedback that we got from stakeholders during when we were creating the form, TCEQ determined that most systems would be able to use the standard street address as their location identifier, but we included column G, which is the other location identifier, and columns um, H and I, which is the GPS coordinates, just as alternative options for systems who might have unique situations like uh, maybe there are multiple service lines that share the same address, so you can use that other location identifier column to differentiate building A, building B, et cetera. Or if you're a rural community and maybe a street address doesn't accurately reflect the location of that service line, you could rather use the GPS coordinates to show where that service line is. So you don't necessarily have to fill out all of those columns, whichever fits your situation. And like we said, most folks I think are gonna be able to use just the street address information but if you have a service line that maybe requires additional information to accurately reflect where it is, then that's what those columns are there for. Okay. 
When systems enter GPS coordinates on the inventory, uh, the template automatically adds two extra zeros to the end of their entries. Does this have an impact on the data that gets submitted? Um, the extra zeros are added by Excel as a means to just format the coordinates. Um, all the coordinates are capped out at seven decimal places. And this ultimately should not impact the data that you're reporting. Um, so for example, a system can put a latitude of 30.01916 on the form, and it's gonna display two extra zeros after that six, but the actual data contained in that cell um, is still gonna be what you entered. So no correction is, is needed. It'll be fine as it is. Uh, okay, our system struggles with technology. This is this is when we get a lot. So either access to a computer, email, um, maybe struggles using Microsoft Excel itself. So how am I going to be able to successfully submit the service line inventory? So our answer to that is that if your system struggles with technology issues, then they may want to either, you can A, reach out to your local library. They often have um, access to computers or Excel. Um, but additionally, TCQ's FMT program is a great resource. As Irina mentioned earlier, um, you know, they are able to even come out on site and help you work through some of those problems and find a solution that would work for you. Uh, what can I do if I'm unable to attend one of TCQ's LCRR presentations or one of the FMT workshops, or maybe I'm not here live for this vlog today learning about LCRR information, what can I do? Um, and the answer to that is that you should check out our Lead and Copper playlist on YouTube. I think Karina also gave a plug for that YouTube channel, um, but that's where we have the recordings of the FMT workshop in Georgetown. And there's also instructional videos on how to fill out the inventory form. Um, and we plan to add more videos in the future, but we also have additional um, videos about how to navigate Drinking Water Watch to find lead and copper information um, and some other just great resources. So if you're looking for a video or you weren't able to attend something live in person, come check out our videos on the TCQ YouTube page. Uh, they're a great resource. Oh, and there's a link. There'll be a link uh, to that YouTube as well. So, but, uh, is sampling a method that you can use to rule out if a line is lead or not? So for example, if a system were to do sequential sampling and came back with no detects of lead, can they use that documentation to prove no lead in the system? So at this time, uh, EPA does not indicate that water quality sampling, which is also targeted sampling, flush sampling, or sequential sampling, um, EPA does not indicate that that can be used for service line material determination. Per section 5.2 of the EPA guidance, um, water quality sampling is more appropriately used as a screening tool. So it's low and non-detect levels may uh, not reliably uh, detect the absence of lead service lines. So the LCRR requires, again, documentation review, and if record review indicates that the material or construction uh, based on code, ordinance, tap records, et cetera, this is what should be noted in the inventory. Mm -hmm. right, and that gets into these next two that are, are really good. These are ones that I think probably have been coming up the most. So what's TCEQ's stance on the use of predictive modeling or artificial intelligence or statistical modeling or machine learning um, in order to complete the service line inventory? So again, EPA does not indicate that predictive models can be used for determination. Per section 5.5 of the guidance, predictive models can be used for prioritizing areas of uh, service line investigations and for uh, expediting lead service line replacement. The models can be used to make uh, inferences about areas of unknown conditions 
So TCEQ recognizes that predictive modeling is a tool um, for prioritizing investigations of unknown sites, but it cannot be used to prove a negative. So again, mm -hmm. LCRR requires documentation review, um, and that's what we recommend. Sorry, that was a <laughs> bummed out about that answer, I guess. But <laughs> yeah, that's that's our our stance on the predictive modeling. And going off of that, I want to talk about um, our stance on the use of emerging technologies. So this is we've heard things about um, metal detectors or the swordfish technology you may have heard of. All of those count under the categorization of emerging technologies. So again, EPA does not indicate that emerging technologies can be used for service line material determination. Um, this is covered in section 5.6 of the guidance uh, where they say that emerging technologies have a technical basis but limited research or field implementation to demonstrate their effectiveness. Um, and again, LCRR requires uh, record review, documentation review. So um, we will be going off of, you know, what EPA has determined is a method for material determination. So predictive modeling, these emerging technologies, and even the um, sequential or water quality sampling are not methods approved by EPA at this time. Um, going off of the predictive modeling and the emerging technologies, just want to give just a, a recent story or a warning to folks um, to be careful when people are trying to sell you something. So if you are looking at a company that is selling a technology or a service to you, a software, mm -hmm. and they tell you that this is approved by TCEQ, well, I know that all of you in this room have heard directly from TCEQ today, and you know that that's not true. But, you know, be careful when someone is trying to sell you something. Um, you might want to fact check that information first. So we found at least a couple of circumstances where folks uh, on a website or something was released that was misleading and maybe maybe made it sound like TC, C, TCEQ had approved mm -hmm. this technology or this software. Um, and as you can see from today, that is not the case. So keep checking with us if there are any updates or if we have made any changes to what we have approved, but we have not approved any such technology to date. Mm -hmm. uh, da, da, da. I'm gonna scroll. We're almost there, I promise. But you can see how many questions we've been getting. So, um, you know, at least we love a question. Continue to ask us our questions, your questions. Um, and as they come in, we're gonna try and share those answers with you as much as possible. So uh, this is the last question. On the PWS information worksheet of the TCQ inventory form, it asks if a community if a community water system do multifamily residences comprise at least twenty percent of the structures you serve. So does this need to be the individual apartment units, or should you count? Or should the count be based on the number of multifamily buildings? So this is maybe a, a very technical question, but the LCRR specifies that when multifamily residences comprise at least 20% of the structure served um, by the water system, then so, no, sorry, I said that funny. The LCRR specifies that when multifamily residences comprise at least 20% of the structure served by the water system, then therefore, when determining uh, the 20%, then that number should be based off of the number of buildings or structures, not the number of individual apartment units. So that one was a little technical, but it was a good question. And I thought it was worth sharing with the group. And I think that's it for the frequently asked questions. Do we have anything in the chat or anything in the room? Nothing online. Oh, we've got one in the back. Yes, sir. Okay. You know, we all have struggled with this, and y'all have too. So, I mean, it's trying to understand everything the EPA is wanting us to do is uh, kind of overwhelming, yeah. especially on a larger system. Yeah. Um, we feel confident on our records on the utility side of the system, and we feel that we have a good grasp on that. We're able to submit the inventory. 
the challenging part, I'm sure, with everybody is what is on the private side. Yeah. And I guess, you know, and, and we've heard from all these companies, they've come bang on our door. They've done pilots. They've done this. So we, we've seen them all. We've, we've done it all. Uh, and, and that's fine. If, it, if it's not approved technology, we understand because we, we watched it work. We know there's question marks on it. We have question marks on it. Well, uh, but when it comes down to it, it seems like the only thing we have available to submit that inventory for the private side is a visual inspection. And as you go look inside you know, the box, there's not but this much to look at. Yeah. And I guess I struggle with uh, the whole inventory. And I'm not blaming y'all by no means. I'm just, you know, are we here to protect public health or are we just here to turn it inventory? Because if I'm looking in that meter box, and I see this much of a piece of pipe, I can report what that is. But am I actually checking the public health, not knowing what that whole segment is up to the house? And then, you know, we're all trying to do the right thing yeah. and, and wanting to protect public health, submit the inventory, be in compliance. But I don't feel like we could get there from here at all. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're doing potholing, we're doing all kinds of things, but even a pothole, is just a, this big segment of pipe. That's all we're seeing. And I mean, it, it's quite frustrating when you're wanting to do the right thing and you're wanting to be fine and you're wanting to, you know, the intent of the rule is to get the lead out at public health. But are we actually able to do that? Or is this just a process? And I'm saying EPA, not at all. Uh, I think just to submit an inventory so we all feel warm and fuzzy. And that's what it feels like said it right from the very beginning that this process is overwhelming yeah and this is not something you know we have an initial due date for an initial inventory october 16th of 2024 but this project is massive especially for the larger systems so you know how are you going to do this massive project and certainly i think you know expecting it to be completely complete done wrapped up in a nice neat bow by october 16th is almost, a dare I say, insane. Um, so that's why, you know, I think EPA wants us to look at this as a living document, that this is something we're going to be working on over time. And, you know, maybe the strategy for right now is, is yeah, you're going to do what you can. We want to be least invasive because we don't want to disturb those lead lines if they are there. You know, you don't want to cause unnecessary lead in someone's line if you don't have to. But as we see, you know, from what EPA has told us, there's no there's no penalty for having to make an update to your inventory. So, you know, what they've required, what they've asked of systems right now is to do a record review. And, you know, based on that record review, maybe there's something in the future as you're doing your normal maintenance and updates that, hey, what I thought based on records was not true and you need to make an update and we're going to just keep chipping away at this over time. That's how we're going to get it done. And it's not necessarily that we have to, speed up or dig everything up by October 16th, we're going to start working on this as a nation over time so that we can ultimately get the lead out. But, um, Shell, I saw you sitting up real close in your chair. Do you have something else to add to this? I wanted to make sure that yeah. I could give you somebody to answer okay. the question I would, but um, I, I agree with her. They're asking you to do something that is a, it's a lifetime experience. We are, I don't know, say a 40. Say a 40. <laughs> if I die at 100, this still not, might not be a completely done document for a city of your size, but a city of Houston size, but city of Austin size. Um, a mobile home park where they eventually will dig up all 20 connections. Yeah, maybe they can get it done. But like you said, the intent is to do what we can. So if the best you can do is a visual inspection of the three inches that go to somebody's line or the two inches that are on either side of the owner shut off or whatever you can do, that's better than nothing. And the other point is the rule. Even if you say you're non lead completely, it doesn't get you out of sampling. Always going to be sampling. So that sampling is our evidence of something maybe going wrong. And as long as you keep moving it to places that you know are not a non lead location or you think are your most likely to be problematic, that sampling is our safety. And it will always be. Um, so I think that that's probably the one thing we have to keep in mind is it's not a one song approach, it's a multi song approach. So if you don't have perfect data, which perfect data does not exist, then you do the best with what you can. 
that is tense behind it, right? Again, the tense is public health. And how do we keep that focus? We'll be making the right decision. If the intent is perfection, so we will pencil it, but we will get things wrong. So that's what I really want to drive people away from. And don't rush to get the wrong answer. Get the answer you have, and over time, we'll get to the full data. But it might not happen in my lifetime. It might not happen in your lifetime. So everybody decides to read their line at some point in time. So just go with it for now. The only thing I can also say is we don't have LCRI yet. Letting copper will improve. We don't know what's coming. There might be more, and we're all going to find out together, and we'll have that discussion later. They no, there is not something they told us they thought September <clears throat> not happening because right now it has not gone to the Office of Management and Budget yet, and it requires basically a 90 day review once it gets to them. So, the earliest we're looking at, based on the way the federal process typically works, would be November. Um, I can't give you anything better than that at this point. Maybe next January's dog will be very exciting. <laughs> Maybe it'll post at least go to OMB by October. Any? Yes. There's some questions. In the, chat? the the two questions are about providing guidance for the inventory form for more than ten thousand records, which is oh. the current like yes. current cap. Uh -huh. um, so that's something we can work on. Yeah, that is something that we've identified as is an issue for folks. Um, I don't know that we have an official guidance on that yet. I think we've told people to to keep working on it just on their desk on their own computer and then we'll we'll figure out right. the best way to report that um, by October of next year. So yeah. you can open multiple copies of that template if you know if that's easier for the system to track for themselves and then we'll we'll come up with a solution um, when it comes time to actually report it. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And then, um, yeah, for any, oh, oh, in the back. Yes. I had that same question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Spreadsheets. Right. So now you can list them. Spreadsheets. Yeah. So you only get to 10,000. You can put them only there, but the micro don't work for what's given 10,000. Right. right. Yeah. So, I think that world. Yeah. Yes. I, I like the question. You know, the LCR, but there's a lot of misinformation out there, even from TCQ. Like when they talk about the money side, they mention stuff about something that is incorrect. They are probably trying to answer this question. But I, I, I do like this thing. So, you can point people to a specific question rather than. To yeah. And then the one thing I was going to ask so basically on the fire lines and irrigation. Uh -huh. So basically, it's going to be up to the system whether to put those lines in the inventory. Well, I mean, from what we have in our database, I can look up how many connections are at the water system. But if you have something, emergency line or something that I don't if it could be used, it's not currently being used. I think that's I don't necessarily have that knowledge for your water system, um, but that's EPA's guidance and recommendation that if if you think that this could be used for potable water at some point in the future, they recommend that you include it in your in your inventory. Again, there's no penalty for updates to the inventory as you go on. Um, so I, you know, I. Be honest that I don't have a way to check that, you know, some uh, fire line is someday going to be a potable, you know, non-emergency line. I don't have a way to know that right now. So that is up to the water system to to kind of have that information or, or know what they think is going to be the future for that line. But, you know, if you want to hold off and, and just make an update later, if that changes, that would be acceptable too. Thank you. Yeah, so we'll, we'll definitely work on the 10,000. Um, it is a known issue. Like you said, you can create multiple tabs, but the issue then does.
goes back to the summary information where it's not calculating correctly. So trying to balance the, the file size, of course, uh, for, for multiple systems, but then, you know, making sure everything still works. So we'll, we'll put out guidance. Uh, I mean, we are going to revisit to when the LCRI language comes out in case any other changes come through. Um, but that is something we are aware of and working. Just as kind of an add on to that, we're in the process of trying to just like the rest of y'all realize how long it takes to purchase something. <laughs> okay, so it takes a really long time for us to get data solutions. Um, but we are in the process of being able to select that solution for ourselves that are going to help us manage that. And by knowing what the end product is, we can make the appropriate changes, but we don't want to make those changes till we know what the product is. Um, so hopefully once we get that uh, solicitation complete, we'll be able to give you all more detail. Not that we don't know it's an issue, we don't want to fix it, but there's no point in fixing it and getting it wrong. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Laura. Um, next up, we have a legislative recap from Michelle, and I will pull that presentation up here. All right, folks. Uh, thank you uh, for your patience, and uh, I know this is the last presentation of the after, of the morning, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, power through it. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask them while we're going through, because I know each bill has its own implications. They stand alone from each other for the most part. Um, and I'd rather have that discussion while it's fresh in your mind. So i um, just going to start off by saying it's always a water session in Texas. It's a limited commodity, getting more and more limited, and people are very interested in it. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go over some of the highlights. Um, it was also a really, really busy legislative session. As you can see, we had, um, here at the TCEQ, we review every bill that's filed, and that ended up being over 11,000, almost 12,000 bills. Um, so. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'm sure you did it too. Um, but of that, we really analyzed ourselves uh, about 200 bills. Um, those are things that had some sort of direct tie in to the water or water supply division side of things. Um, so let's start off with the, with the what didn't make it, because sometimes these will come back up again. Um, and some of them are a good indication of where the future is headed. So um, transparency bills were a big thing. Um, after URI, people were concerned about how they were being communicated with, what exactly we were telling people, how we were telling people these things, how quickly we were telling people these things. I'm not sure this is a surprise to any of you, but there were several bills filed about that, not just uh, about boil water notices, but public notices and uh, how reverse norm one is happening. And then also, as our state grows, um, we are becoming more and more diverse, which is uh, depending on who you speak to, I think a fantastic thing. Um, but that also means not everybody speaks English, not everybody reads English, and there's a lot of languages spoken in our country, read in our country. Um, how do we know when we should be telling people things in different languages so that they're well informed? So there's a lot of things that came up like that. There were also a lot of state of the state type of reports that were requested, things related to climate change, uh, preparing for catastrophe, this big undefined thing. But then also, where are we at infrastructure wise? Um, we all know, and some of you have participated before in the drinking water infrastructure needs survey um, that EPA does to kind of allot our monies. Um, not every legislator knows that exists. Um, so part of them filing that bill is for us to tell them, hey, look, there's this thing. And sometimes they're like, well, that's still not good enough. I want to know a lot more than that. I want to know about every single water system, which valves work and which ones don't. So they really want to go deep down and sometimes they're willing to go with it. Sometimes they're not. Then they see the price tag of how much that costs and it settles down. So um, we're also looking at things related to lead and copper, just like it's a concern to you. It's a concern to everybody else. Uh, some of these have been filed before. And the fact that there is the lead and copper rule, specifically the fact that it now includes the school portion, has made a big uh, a change in this. I think they're really kind of filing them, but waiting because they think that the, the federal rule may come in and trump whatever they wanting to do. Plus, money is involved. That always kind of puts a damper on those types of things. Licensing has been a big deal. Um, Y'all, I have to believe if you're if you're having no trouble finding people to work for you, especially licensed <laughs> operators, please raise your hand. Anybody online? <laughs> I think it's a, a universal problem. So there were some bills filed about giving additional people the ability to be licensed. Things like people who previously worked in the military, people who are military spouses, 
um, people coming from other places, um, faster reciprocity, the no need for reciprocity, those types of things. Um, and then also the protection of your information. So I know a lot of us here are licensed uh, water operators or wastewater operators. And right now you can go onto our website and see a lot of stuff about us. Um, so there's concerns about protection of licensee information, not just ours, but plumbing examiners and um, licensed police officers. So it was related to all licensing. So those are some things that uh, did not necessarily get passed, but were, were filed this year. Enforcement suspension. So um, a lot of people are like, well, if they're trying hard, can you not do anything about it? We'll talk about that more because it also came up in our sunset legislation. So some of those were killed. Some of those actually moved forward. And then one stop water shop. So uh, if you are in our business, you know who Senator Perry is. Um, he is the chairman of the SWORA committee. And this is his bill that he filed. I believe this is a shot across the bow for what the future may hold. Wanting to have a one-stop shop for water, which would mean what we do here, what Texas Water Development Board does there, what PUC does there, if it touches water, one place. Um, so it did not make it very far this year, other than a reading in committee, I believe. Um, but it's also to get people used to the idea. So might be worth reading that bill and kind of getting to see what the what the thoughts might be. So what passed that isn't like super duper water system, but you should probably know about. That's what we're going to talk about here, adjacent awareness. So SB 28 and S SJR 75. So SB 28 actually creates some legislation related to funding. I think that uh, representative from Texas Water Development Board already kind of brought this one up to your attention. But um, starting in November of this year, the fine citizens of the state of Texas have the ability to vote on um, if they are wanting to create the Texas Water Fund and the new water supply for Texas fund. And together combined, that's $1 billion of that $38 billion um, surplus that would potentially go straight into Texas water. Um, so if by any chance, some of y'all don't always rank all that high on SRF funding. You're, you're, you're too good at what you do. You don't have enough problems. Maybe there's another option here. If you're running short on water, because as we said, it's a limited commodity that's not being made anymore. If you can come up with another way to make it, that's what that new water supply for Texas fund. Um, there is a lot of emphasis on the produced water consortium, which is you know, oil and gas refuse water. Um, but there's a lot of other water we can squeeze out of a stone that could potentially have less scary things in it than produced water. So um, if you're you know, in that realm or thinking about that realm, there's a possibility of $250 million to go towards that. What actually did pass and might blatantly affect you? So we're gonna start kind of sort of low hanging fruit. Uh, that caption at the top is what they put on the bill. It will tell you very little about the bill until you actually read it. But in this one, they're talking about recharge injection wells. So if you ever get your water from an underground source, this one might be of concern to you. So it passed and it gives TCEQ, not the water supply division, but the agency as a whole, exclusive jurisdiction over the injection wells, specifically related to fluid, oil, and gas waste. And it says we get to make the rules as to what can go in. So. Yes, if that wasn't on your radar, now it is. Um, there will obviously be a rulemaking process. We are not the ones at the at the base of this rule. Um, I believe remediation in the Office of Waste is, but I would keep your eyes open for stakeholder opportunities. Questions, thoughts before we move on from that one? Previously, the Railroad Commission oversaw this? Yes, well, they oversaw oil and they oversaw fluid oil and gas waste but not necessarily the jurisdiction for injection because I don't believe it was allowed. Also not my specialty, so <laughs> take that as a grain of salt. There's an MOU. There's a memorandum of understanding. There we go. Yeah. Gulai comes to us from the Office of Waste and has way more knowledge about than I do. <laughs> so now let's talk super duper. This actually for sure impacts you. That's that right, okay. Let's start with the one I know you all want to talk about. So House Bill 3810. This is a bill that says uh, certain notices are required to the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality by public water systems. 
here's the two big things it says. So the first thing is going to be a non-industrial public water system. So if you work for Dow or um, NRG or somebody like that, this one doesn't apply. Turn yours off. If you work for anyone else who is non-industrial, this applies to you. Um, and what you have to do is you have to tell us, the TCEQ, when you issue a do not use, a do not consume, or a boil water notice. But when this, where this goes is not in our regular, you know, public notice 122, acute notice 24 hour. This goes into the same area as our Homeland Security, which says immediately. Immediately means within 15 minutes. That's how it's typically been implemented in the past. So putting that on your radar, I'm sure plenty of you already were aware of this one. Um, it goes on to say that not only do you have to do that notice, but here's some stipulations related to it. It tells us that we can work with TDEM, the Texas Division, I should say a division, my apologies, Division of Emergency Management on the administration. So realistically, the intent of this bill is so that TDEM can help you. I know that you may not believe that, but here's the thing. It's not going in the compliance portions of our rules. It's going in the Homeland Security and physical security portion of our rules. And the idea is to make sure that if you have a do not consume, a do not use a boil, they can know about the resources you might need, like boiled water, like water buffalo tank trucks, those kind of things, and they can stage them to get them to you faster. That's the intent behind this bill. That means if you only have, you know, a one street out that has eight connections, you tell them, they know, oh, I don't need to send them anything. Or if I do, I need to send them a couple cases of water. Whereas if they tell you tell them, I'm going to have half of my city of a million people down, then they know they've got to move a lot more resources a lot faster. So that's the intent behind the bill. The other thing is it says uh, non-industrials, which once again doesn't apply to most of you, don't have to tell us, and actually all of you don't have to tell us when there's a dedicated emergency. If we all know Hurricane Harvey's calling, don't call me. We got other things on our plate. We already know there's going to be a problem or there's potentially going to be a problem. We need to know if it happens. So that's the Cliff's Notes on the bill. One thing that happened before it passed, the last time it was in, in the uh, Senate committee before it got passed to the floor, Senator Perry basically said, I know y'all don't like the wording, so we're going to work that out in the stakeholder process. This is the stakeholder process. Mm. So I'd be really interested to hear what you think this should say, knowing the intent. What are your concerns, knowing the intent? So I'll stop here. Anybody have something initially that they want to share with the group? Did we do the bond of the non-industrial public water system? That is a great question. We did not, they did not. We pointed out that it's not defined. So, no, is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question is whether we'll choose to do that or whether we'll choose to use that as something that, if it's not defined in our rule, then it would be based on, you know, the legal definition, of course, our lawyer who usually works with us, Ruth, is on the phone. She's probably telling me to shut up because I'm not a lawyer. Um, <laughs> but we'd have to look at what that definition really means and, and whether we have to actually define it or not. Um, there will be a rule package coming from this. So that's why I want to see what y'all have to say. So you want every work order that we have? Because every work order, most of them require shutting off the water to somebody to fix a broken main or even to fix a leak to a house. So that's the definition of outage or something <laughs> else that needs to be I mean, because every day people are without water. It's a short period of time normally, and it's routine yeah. stuff. Yes, and we, we did speak to uh, to Chief Kidd is the guy who, who runs TNM, and he, has, he said, but I want to know about it. He says, it doesn't matter if you can tell me a thousand things a day. So that, that's... <laughs> Multiply that by about 20. And right, because there's going to be 7,000 water systems and potentially 5,500 in this non-industrial category, right? What so what's the value? The value is really for those situations, and I hate to tell you this, but they've been stung on the back end, right? Where we find out that there's a mobile home park that's been out of water for, you know, 200 days and nobody even told us. That's really what this is trying to get to. But also, you know, if, if by any chance a large city knows that they're struggling, they're on the brink. They need to know, they need to know, TDM needs to know before it's too late that they can move things in that direction. If the water is in transit and it turns out you don't go under boil water notice, 
so bad, so sad. Those are spent resources that the people of the city, the state could have benefited from. But if they don't find out, so you're already under, they're probably 24 to 36 hours out. But you don't necessarily know these things until the last minute that you're under a boil water. Sometimes you I don't. Mean, there's, there's no way to predict a boil water now, is it? No, but sometimes you know that you know you're losing pressure or you know the flood is coming or you know you're about to suck air out of your, your lake intake. So there are different times when you might know. Sometimes it's just you know what happened, you got to tell us. Kind of mm -hmm. if this kind of falls underneath that direction because I think you're exactly right. I mean, on a day in, day out, we've got 400 membranes mm -hmm. for isolating so many miles of pipe on a daily basis. So, I mean, unless you're meeting one of those three criteria do not use advisory, do not consume advisory, or bowl water notice, then we do not need to tell them anything. That's the way it's currently written. So, let me read you the actual language so that way um, I'm not paraphrasing or getting it incorrect. So cut and pasted from what was placed into the Texas register. For a non-industrial public water system supply, an unplanned condition that has caused, we used to say it was likely to, so bear in mind that they've actually changed the language, has caused a, water, a public water supply outage or the public water supply system to issue, not to potentially issue, to actually issue a do not use advisory, a do not consume advisory or a boil water notice. So if you're able to fix it under pressure and not go into a boil water notice, don't need to talk to me about it. Remember, this is where I want to emphasize that we have a boil water notice flow chart that gives you options to not do a boil water notice. Yes. Yes. The word or is in there. I yep. and it says cause the water supply outage or not and the public water supply too. Yeah, <laughs> we'll get to the bottom of that, because bear in mind, he also said that we're going to be working on the language. The intent was any of these situations. Not any house out of water, but anytime there's a do not use, do not consume or BWN. Boil water notice. Yeah. So I would assume that if you have to issue that and tell TDM, you also have to tell them when you're out of that situation. So we said they sh they'll be following it at that point. Um, they probably end up with the rescind just like we would. So that wasn't covered in this. For those three, would we be telling y'all as well? We would. The difference is the timing. So realistically, you're telling us because we're going to coordinate with them. But the goal is for them to know. They're the ones that really want this. And, and we do want it because we do hear from you guys. And sometimes we hear, you know, well past the 24 hours we're supposed to. So the earlier we know, the better. Um, but the intent is to get those things moving faster. Mary Alice, I've seen your hand a couple times. Sorry. Yeah, I I know that there's guidance that says what a do not well kind of what a do not use advisory and do not consume advisory are, but they're not in the rules. They're not defined. Um, are y'all going to define them actually in the rules? They are defined in twenty in two ninety forty six. They're listed as special precautions, and it tells you what a special precaution is. So they they are defined from that perspective. They are not defined individually. Okay, that could be based on stakeholder feedback. That could be something we need to look at. And then the 15 minutes. I mean, that's I know at least for some of our systems that are really small. If they're out there in the middle of nowhere. How are they going to comply with the notification that's part of 15 minutes? Phone call. It's a, it's a hotline. Just like now, if somebody, um, Letty knows that she's our Homeland Security advice, uh, re coordinator, but if somebody walks up on their pump station and finds out that somebody stole, their, stole the copper from their pumps, or cut their electrical lines. It's the same portion of our rule, 15 minutes that you're supposed to call hotline. Um, so that is existing for other things that could potentially happen to your water system. Um, immediately is what it says. Historically, that's been interpreted as 15 minutes. But you're you now going to be. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. But you're now going to be adding a, if it's any unplanned condition that has caused any type of public water supply outage, your toll free number is going to get a lot more hits. Yes, that was a concern we expressed too, which is why they specifically included the requirement or the allowance in C1 that TDM can help us administer. We'd both be, we'd all be working to make sure that that line gets answered. Are there enough incoming lines for it? Supposedly, they were able to handle everything during URI, so that is a concern to be addressed, but that's unfortunately not something that can be argued on the rule. 
Yes. Michelle, will we have a formal stakeholder meeting to develop the rulemaking on this? How, what's your plan for? There's, there's a lot of nuances here to be worked out, and we'd certainly like to help the agency with input from the utilities. What, what's the plan for doing rulemaking on this? So the initial thought right now would be once we close up today, which I'll uh, I'll tell you we are trying to get it up for today, but we're sending out kind of like we do currently a form and a form that says, hey, I know that during session, some of y'all sent letters to legislators with what you what language you wanted. So knowing the intent, propose what language you want. Um, based on the way the stakeholder process works or the rulemaking process works with us, I, I can't tell you what language we, we are working on, but I can get feedback from you on what language you want. So that would be my first step. And then we'll look at that information and we will be looking at uh, the October um, DWAG to look really consolidate that down. And we may have a stakeholder group, stakeholder group kind of like we do for LCRR after this to, to talk to the smaller, because uh, like I said, the the DAOs and the and the those people in the world don't need to be in this conversation because they're an industrial user. Um, no matter how you cut it, they're industrial, whether we define it or not. So making sure that we have the right people in the room to have that discussion. The other side of that is um, for those of you, I was going to pull it up, but I didn't actually bring my computer. Um, we have a rule package open right now. So if you do not know, our Senate Bill Three, which is the EPP plus, includes some of the recommendations from Winter Storm Uri and has already opened up the boil water notice section of our rules. So until that rule package is complete, which we're thinking is around the December timeline, we can't even reopen it. We'll have to do a whole, we have to let it close, finalize, and then we have to reopen it. So there is a delay either way on the implementation related to this. So this is our opportunity for you to A, go in there and make sure you've read what it now says about boil water notices. Make sure that you are cool with that. Um, also, the and I'll, I'll pull it up at the end end of this discussion, but the ability to file comments is already um, up there and available to you. I think it closes on the 28th. Um, so your opportunity to, to have that, and there's also a public meeting that will come up related to that. They're all posted on the rulemaking site, which I'll take you to. Um, those things are, are already a now issue. And then based on what you see there, what would you like to have it say? And I can tell you right now, um, sorry, let me actually just go there. Um, so does everybody know how to get to our rules? Google is amazing. Type in TCQ rules and PDF, it'll get you there. Oh, sorry, good deal. There we go. There we go. Okay. So type in TCQ rules and PDF. It'll bring up our rules. You can search 290 because that's where our, most of our rules are. And if you go to subchapter D, rules and regulations for public water systems, that's where the immediate notification portion of our rules is. Um, so the most recent version is that last one you'll see there. Here you go. It's a, it's a searchable PDF document, so you can hit control find. And uh, there you go. Most of the immediately are going to be in that section. So I'm trying to get there as quickly as possible. Here we go. So security is where they're putting this. Um, they're adding the new section six. Um, so all systems must shall maintain internal procedures to notify the ED by a toll free phone number immediately of the following events. If the event negatively impacts the production or delivery of safe and adequate drinking water, and then it leads out what the events are. It's adding this event as item six. OK, so I would also encourage you to read this portion of the rule. Make sure you know how you already comply with it and how the intent that we just discussed can fit into this. OK. Yes. One more thing to think about in the rulemaking process. We can't document a phone call. Because it's not written, there's no actual record of it. So documenting compliance, which is always a concern, is tough when it's a call. Yeah, and bear in mind that we actually did mention that. It's not something that was modified during the, the rule language. Um, but subchapter D, and specifically these notifications, as I said, this is about assistance, not about compliance. So we do encourage people to keep a telephone log 
and you know that you can do the whole, uh, you know, do a screenshot of when you called a number on your phone and there's all those things you can do. Um, so it would just be a matter of developing that process internally for yourselves. From a TCEQ perspective, our intent is to make sure that you're getting the assistance you need, not to be hitting you on for compliance. Uh, Andy's here from the Office of Compliance and Enforcement. So if you have anything to redirect on that, please let me know. But that's really what our thought is. And that's what Tedum's thought is. This is about getting you assistance. It's not about making sure that we, we can run you up on a, a, an enforcement case from our perspective. Um, yes, Gary. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, so, you know, going back to that definition, uh, you know, another perspective, especially if you're talking about an emergency management perspective, is it, it doesn't just say outage, it says public water supply outage. So, you know, another perspective on that is if the system would be not able to stay in supplying water. Um, you know, I think we've all our minds have all gone to this individual connection, routine business. And I, you know, a different perspective is if we're, especially if we're talking about emergency management, wouldn't I mean question could be, wouldn't that only be if we're in a catastrophe or in danger of of a supply outage? The entire it doesn't say a partial outage, a yeah, water supply outage, outage would be the whole system down. Uh, you know, if we're talking about emergency management and assistance, that's what I'd want TDEM's assistance. Yeah. Um, but the intake is is compromised uh, or drought. Um, so, but if I heard you right, Michelle, you were saying that TDEM does want to know about even one connection being shut off for a couple of hours. I, that, that's just something. That's what they did say. Now, that's the that's the point of our discussion is is to make sure that we understand what realistically is happening. If you lose a whole line, that's a system outage. If you turn someone off because they didn't pay their bill, that's not a system outage. That's turning off a service line. So I do want to be able to, you know, make those distinctions. And that's why I want you guys to kind of give me what your pain points are so we can address your pain points. Um, if, if through this form, you can tell us whatever language you want and what your pain points are, we can have a discussion of those pain points and get to a language that hopefully Addresses the intent, but doesn't put you in unnecessary pain. I think yeah. the, the key for us would be to get some definition. Help us define yeah. what that looks like. Sorry, let me resume from here. Um, I know that we're cutting it close to, to noon, so my apologies. Um, do, 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 do. So that one is definitely going to be a we have to talk more anyway. Um, so keep. Keep your eye out for anyone who registered for this. Um, and those of you who weren't here in person or who are here in person, I think I know who most of you are, but let's make sure we get your contact information. Hopefully you're part of the DWOG group because we'll send that form out through the DWOG group and through the courtesy reminder system. Let me yes. say 3810 won't go into effect. Now, here's the thing. It will be effective from the fact that the statute will exist. So the intent would be for you to try and comply, which means if you if you think you fall in that category without any additional definition, call the toll free number. The toll free number already exists. It's like that environmental enviro help number. But I'll get you that number. Um, we'll follow up because that's not a number we currently monitor. Uh, currently, the Office of Compliance and Enforcement monitors that number. Um, but September 1st, that will be the thought is if you think this applies to you, you would call. Um, but we won't have rules in place that are our codification of the statute until we do a full rule package and all that kind of stuff. Um, so in the interim, it's it's really a matter of, of your understanding of your Mary Alice? And I'm sorry, I might be being pedantic, but I wanna make sure I understand. Um, I know when we were going through and spitting language when the uh, bill was going through the legislature, uh, that it was supposed to be for unplanned. So this definitely doesn't apply to anything that has to do with disconnecting because of failure to pay. Uh, the other thing is, is that my understanding of the, of the bill was that the notification wasn't required until the actual outage occurred. That's the way it's written now. It originally said, or is likely to cause. Now it right. says cause. Right. Yeah, that, that was taken out. Right. Um, so that's, but that's not going to be put back in rule wise. I, I, I was a little confused because I thought I heard you say if a city knew that Possibly there would be an outage that a notification. Would Statutory be. requirement and best practices are different things. Okay. It's always the best practice. If 
if you are on a system that runs on 100 wells and 50 of them are failing, you probably should talk to us anyway. It doesn't mean you need to do it by rule. Um, so best management practice versus actually statutory versus actually codified are different things. Um, it's always a good idea if you are a system that's losing pressure and you need to talk to us about it before that happens. If you want to do a partial boil water notice, we can't do that in the 15 minute in the in between 15 minutes when you tell us and 24 hours when you have to have issued it to your public. We cannot look at the hydraulic situation separation of your city in that amount of time. So if you're ever going to want to be in that situation, you need to talk to us well in advance. So that's what I'm telling everyone for best management practices. You can always talk to us at a time. This is what the rule says. The rule is going to say you need to tell us when it happens. Okay. All right. So that's there's going to be way more talk on that one. Probably should have left it for last. But um, this other one is um, SB 594, which Zafarini put forth, and it really talks about RV park connections. So it's telling you that a PDF, PWS shall provide a quantity of water of capacity of water sufficient to serve the number of connections served by the public water system supply. Y'all know that you need to have enough water for your people. The difference is how we're going to define it. So instead of just having the one connection definition we have, they want to redefine that eight RV cabins, eight RVs or cabin sites is equivalent to one connection. And this is specifically for RV parks served by a PWS that provides service through meters. So we're reading this language currently to say if you are the city of XYZ, and you serve an RV park within your area through a meter, then that's when this connection equivalency would apply to you. So that's where we're gonna have to look at how we actually codify this. They were pretty specific from the perspective that, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the, the rule, the, the statute they put forth was pretty specific about the fact that it should be based on industry standards, it should be based on each meter size, and then it should also allow not only um, them, but anyone that applies to, to come in for a variance if the actual system use is more than 10% below that equivalency value. So it gives you wiggle room. Um, how we're gonna codify that uh, PTRS will be working with folks to, to make that happen. Um, but this is another one of those that, um, I think that they know what they were trying to do, but they might not have worded it correct, quite right for what they wanted to do. So once again, this is a practically speaking, how is this going to happen? Um, we've already received the question of in the interim, which, by the way, this is another September 1st bill. They have already asked, well, in the interim, what are you going to do? Well, in the interim, our rules are our rules. It's the only thing we can enforce. Um, so statute to statute, we'll be working on the codification of that, probably in the same rule package that we've been working on the codification of the 3810 rule we just discussed. So. When those become uh, final rules is when we'd be probably taking a look at this. But if by any chance this benefits you, that's when enforcement discretion comes in. If by any chance, especially this shall allow for variances if the actual use is below, if you you know that RV park does not use much and you can document that it does not use much and it's nowhere near as what that what one for eight get to go is, now the time to start gathering your documentation to substantiate that claim and uh, being able to take advantage of that stipulation. So this is not forward. You got to look backwards to if your existing connections. Your existing connections. So if you have RV parts in your system, you got to go back and do that equivalence. Yep. I know. And this is just RV, so it doesn't apply to mobile phone. It says RVs and cabin sites. It's meant to be transient accommodation units, basically, based on the way our rule was written. Because they, you know, our capacity rules are, are based on transient accommodation units. They, um, the people writing the rule aren't familiar with our rules. They, or writing the statute are not familiar with our rules. They're familiar with the statute. Okay. And one one thing I want to point out, <clears throat> even though it doesn't say it here, it says it in the rule itself, is that it's based on RV as defined in the uh, the existing government code, and that is a of RV park is designed for transient use. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's being used in a transitory fashion. So like, for instance, it doesn't exist anymore, but there was a place called Shady Grove RV Park in downtown Austin. People lived there 24-7, 365, but it was designed for transient use. So it would still be, even if they live there 24-7, 365, based on the way this statute is written, that equivalency would still apply to them. Okay? All right. 
Cool. Um, last one. I don't. I don't think this will apply to many. Well, it's not the last last one, but we'll run through them real quick. So we're at the end of our time. Um, Twenty four oh six. If you are somebody who is uh, serving a population of more than two hundred fifty thousand and borders the Neches River, please raise your hand. Great. If you're attending online and you meant to raise your hand, please read this bill because it applies to you and only you. It allows you the ability to drill a, a, a well to uh, accommodate your hospital. Um, <laughs> House Bill 4559 by Darby. The impact is zero, but what it does is it changes the populations to make sure that the EPPs that apply to uh, to Fort Bend and Harris County still only apply to Fort Bend and Harris County. It used to be with the populations that were stipulated, Montgomery would have sucked its way in there. So this rewrites the populations to keep them separate again. So in the end, effective no change to you, but it did change in statute. And then if you are a district, quite a few things happen to districts, change in districts. Please attend our district stakeholder group on Friday, and we'll talk more about those types of things. Um, they had about 70 plus bills that created new ones, modified them, gave them different powers, different things like that. And then finally, super duper actual last one is our sunset bill. So uh, Senate Bill 1397 was uh, continued the agency for 12 years. Everybody celebrate, mm. right? Okay, I hope you do celebrate because that means we're actually continue to be here um, and, and hopefully help you because um, that is our intent. But a lot of the things aren't going to impact us. One of the things I really want to point out there is that one of the recommendations was compliance training and a safety program that uh, Andy just bailed out because he has another meeting. But um, that's his his program area. They're wanting to defer people from enforcement where possible when they're making an honest effort to do better. We in the Water Supply Division generally issue violations for actual Safe Drinking Water Act federal rules. We, we can't take advantage of this program. But if you have other program things like subchapter D items related to potentially capacity or um, setbacks or something like that, that's a, that's a state rule, um, you could potentially be able to take advantage of the compliance diversion program um, that they've asked us to implement as part of our sunset review. Okay, long over our time. Sorry, should have started earlier. Um, if you have any questions, let us know. Otherwise, uh, we will be revisiting with you guys, at least on House Bill 3810. Yes. This be case be posted somewhere later? Yeah, uh, it usually it's about a week now. Yeah. It's taken a little longer, but it will be posted. Yeah. Yeah, a week after to the YouTube, YouTube. Uh, main wait is captioning. OK, yeah. All right. And then just for you guys, uh, if you go to our TCQ website and then put in. Um, rule making. Yeah. That is where uh, you will be able to find the current rule that is out for out for comment. Dragon. Yeah, sorry, I'm dragging it. This takes me forever because I got untalented fingers. So click on uh, participating in rulemaking. And it'll give you different options. One of them is uh, the <laughs> how to comment. It'll tell you how to actually do it, and then it'll take you down to rule proposals. And the project numbers are here. The one you're interested in is this Senate Bill 3 and staff initiated revisions and efficiencies. And the comments are due on August the 14th. OK. All right. Thank you guys very much. I'll go ahead and uh, get this rolled up. If you have any questions, we'll be around. Definitely. Thanks, James.